Hey, Black Rock, thank you for being with us this morning. Uh, we are excited for you to uh, encounter Jesus today, and we're going to be, be hearing from Pastor Kevin. Uh, he is our uh, young adults pastor here at the church. He actually, like 22, 23 years ago, uh, was my mentor when I was in college uh, and studying to be in ministry. He uh, mentored me while I was an intern here in the summers. And so excited to have Pastor Kevin, who is on staff here uh, with us. Hey, I'm Pastor Jeremy. Um, I am our executive director and missions pastor and just want to welcome you to church. I know a lot of you are probably on spring break. Either you're coming back from spring break or you're going on spring break. My family was on spring break this last week, and we got the privilege of going to uh, up to Niagara Falls and seeing the Falls. I had never been there, and I got to take my my kids and my wife up there, and uh, it was awe inspiring. Uh, I we got to go on the little boat ride, and you're you drive into the mist, and you're surrounded by the rush of, I think it's six hundred thousand gallons a second of water coming over the falls, uh, and uh, you're just in awe of awe of God and His creation and. Uh, his beauty. And so it was, uh, I would say, awe-inspiring for me and my one son as uh, we were holding on for dear life uh, as the boat was rocking back and forth of just going, wow, this is unbelievable. And so I hope that you've had a encouraging week um, and that God has spoken to you. And as we go into worship today, God wants to continue to speak uh to you and uh, into your heart. And so I pray that your heart is open uh, to what God has for you. Uh, we are uh, in this two-week series. It's the last week of uh, the stories that Jesus told. Uh, and we're really just looking at um, how Jesus was a storyteller, but how those stories that he told inspire us to want to live for him and for what uh, he desires for us. Our world's in chaos. I was watching the news last night and seeing uh, what's happening in the Middle East and uh, just uh, praying for Israel. Um, and in that, but had a peace and just saying, hey, God is in control. Even when there's uh, drones and rockets and, and missiles being fired, God is in control. And so God's in control of your heart and he wants to speak to you today. And so I hope that your heart is open to him. Hey, one of the things that we are announcing today, if you have not heard, is that we have our Women's Weekend coming up uh, in May. And this is a great weekend for uh, all the ladies here at the church to get away for a couple of days and to uh, just encounter Jesus and to build a community. And especially at Black Rock, uh, with uh, the, just the, the vast number of people coming here, it's sometimes hard to get connected. I would say if you are not connected here, uh, you're probably hesitant to say, hey, I don't know anyone who's going on Women's Weekend. Uh, why would I want to go? Well, you want to go because you want to get connected to others. And so uh, go online uh, to blackrock.org slash info today to uh, sign up and to register. I, I do know that we usually sell out Women's Weekends. So if you do want to go, uh, definitely take some time to uh, sign up for that. And as we go into worship, uh, as we sing these songs and as you you hear uh, what, what is being taught to you through uh, the sermon, open your heart and sing out loud and uh, engage with what God wants for you today. And so I want to encourage you with that. Hey, I'll be back after the service to wrap things up, uh, but I'm going to pass you over to the worship center and for what God has for you today. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Let everything that has birth in the house, praise the Lord. Amen. Can we all stand? We thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Stars too. 
Jesus, this song is forever yours. A thousand hallelujahs and a thousand more. Here we go.
silence all my fears Even the worst of my mistakes A mirror
fan, and I want to welcome you to Black Rock Church. If this is your first time here, I want to thank you for choosing Black Rock as your place to worship and come closer to God. We're excited that you're here. If you're new or if you haven't connected with us yet, I want to encourage you to stop by the Connection Center to pick up a gift and let us know that you are here. Ladies, Women's Weekend is coming quickly. Join us May 3rd through 5th at Harbor Cedars Bible Conference in New Jersey. This will be a special weekend to gather together as women of all generations and walks of life to connect with God and become more rooted in Christ through worship, messages, testimonies, prayer, and encouragement. We will grow together in our faith and equip each other to share the love of Jesus with our families, friends, community, and throughout the world. Invite a friend to join you and register for a room together. Visit the booth in the Welcome Center to ask questions and register, or visit our website at blackrock.org slash info. Thank you again for joining us today. Now let's continue in a time of prayer and worship. Will you join your hearts with mine in prayer? Father, we thank you so much for all that you do for us, Lord. Thank you that you don't have to come, but you do. But Father, we ask that as we pray to you, that we know that you hear us, and we pray especially today for all of our global partners and missionaries around the world. Father, we thank you for each one of them that has surrendered their life to you and obeyed the call on their life to go. Lord, especially this this month, we lift up the Hunt family as they are in France and they are learning the French language so that they can serve Arabic people in France and in refugees from around the world to demonstrate the love of Christ to them and to model that heart to them. Father, we specifically pray for their daughter, Ava, as she starts school in a foreign country with a foreign language. Lord, I pray that she would make amazing friends, Lord, quickly. I pray for the the team that has surrounded the hunts, Lord, as the the ministry continues to grow and the team continues to grow. Give them wisdom in leading that team in serving in their church. And Lord, above all, I ask that you would open up doors of opportunity to speak into the lives and the hearts of the people that you've called them to, that they may see you. Father, today, as we continue to worship you and praise you, we ask that you would turn our affection and attention to you, that we would worship to an audience of one, that we would give you the praise you deserve. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would touch every heart, every mind, open every eye till we see Jesus in his glory. In your name we pray, amen. Who am I that the highest being would welcome me? I was lost, but he brought me Oh, his love for me Oh, his love Just like 
morning, Black Rock. How you doing? I'm Pastor Kevin. I'm part of the team here at Black Rock, and I'm so glad each one of you is here. How many of you were here last week when I preached? Wow, you came back. I'm so surprised. I'm so glad to have you here. We are, uh, that, that, uh, uh, that makes my heart happy. In 2019, I got a call from my dad who's living uh, in Pennsylvania with my mom in a retirement community, and uh, he called up and he said, hey, Kevin, your mom and I are going to Israel. We're going to the Holy Land. I'm like, that's amazing. He goes, yeah, we want you to come with us. And I said, well, I'd love to come with you. And he said, we're even willing to pay for you to come with us. And I said, I'm there. And uh, so they paid for us to go. My father said every pastor should, have to, should be able to go to the Israel at least once in their life, and we'd like to take you to go. And I'm like, that's fantastic. And he goes, and we're going with our retirement community. <laughs> okay, that sounds good. And so uh, Carrie and I had an opportunity to travel for 10 days through Israel with uh, a group of about 50 of us. And uh, most of the people that were there and traveling with us on our team and in our bus were all in their 70s, 80s, and even 90s. Uh, it was awesome. It was great. It was not the fastest moving group that through Israel, <laughs> but, but it was awesome to travel on the bus with these octogenarians, these people that had lived a full life, people that were part of the, the greatest generation. And and we would sit and have meals together, and I would ask them questions about their life, and some of them had been married for 50, 60, and plus years, just a wealth of, of, of knowledge and wisdom. And there was one day that I was sitting with a group of about six older guys at the table. Uh, and I have to tell this part of the story, too. Several of them would say, now Carrie and I were in our mid-40s at the time, and, and they would say to us, uh, oh, you remind us of, of our son, Kevin. I'm like, Awesome. How old's your son? They said 67. <laughs> wow. We were sitting one day uh, in a cafe eating falafel and shakshuka. Oh, I'm hungry now. So, uh, and these guys were talking, and I was asking them questions, and uh, one of them, who's in his late 80s, looked me sternly in the eye, and he said, Kevin, I have some advice for you. He had my attention. He goes, I have a piece of wisdom you're going to need as you enter the last phase of your life. I thought that was a little <laughs> premature, but. <laughs> but I'm listening, I'm waiting for these pearls of wisdom. I'm about to pull out my journal and to write down this thing. He goes, I've got one main piece of advice. I'm like, wow, he's boiling 80 plus years down to one thing. I'm waiting for the secret of a happy marriage, a long life. He was a follower of Jesus. I'm waiting for some Bible verse to transform, something I've never seen before. And he looks at me dead in the eyes, sternly, and he says, I've got one piece of advice for you, Kevin. Invest in a really good nose hair trimmer. Because <laughs> you're gonna need it. That story has absolutely no point whatsoever. But we're in a series, a two-week series called Stories Jesus Told, in which we look at stories, often called parables, that Jesus would teach for a purpose, with a point, that we've been studying for 2,000 years and still extracting the wealth of spiritual depth and principles within these stories. And last week I said Jesus in these stories was always looking to change our perspectives, to change the way we thought, the way we see things, and I gave you this, this, uh, this tool that, that one of our spiritual mentors gave Carrie and I years ago that I think is really helpful. But Jesus was trying, he, Jesus knew this principle, uh, and it's this, what we believe affects how we perceive. What we perceive affects what we're able to and willing to receive, and what we receive will affect what we're able to achieve and to walk out in our lifetimes and the purposes that God has for us. What we believe affects what we perceive and how we receive and what we're able to achieve. And these stories that Jesus would tell were to try to flip a light switch in our souls that we would believe rightly, that we would see ourselves and the Lord and the kingdom of God and the world around us as he sees it better so that we can receive everything he has for us and achieve all that he's created us and called us to do. 
And last week, I, I put up a picture. For those of you who are here, it was a picture. Uh, it was one of those optical illusions of plates upside down that if you found one that was right side up, they would all flip for you. I'm gonna give you another one, okay? So if we can put this on the screen. Don't say it. The person next to you, that, that's cheating. That's not good. But take a look at this pile of rocks and from within it will emerge some words and some letters. If it helps, you can squint. You can see it. Raise your hand once you get it. You can see it. Great. Last week, I said if you couldn't see it, it's because you're more intelligent. This week, I think it's because you need to eat more green leafy vegetables. You need to have some more fiber in your diet. Get some carrots for your eyes. Some of it's starting to land. Within these rocks are words that Jesus quoted from the Old Testament when he entered into Jerusalem and people were worshiping him and people didn't like it. The religious leaders didn't like it. And he says, if they don't praise me, even the stones will cry out. Some of you are saying, what are you talking about? All right, close your eyes. We'll pray for all the blind people. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> In those rocks are those words. If it helps, you can look at the back wall. That smaller picture might help. Oh, I see it now. No, you don't. You're just, you know, peer pressure. <laughs> but today we're gonna look at another story that Jesus tells. It's a, it's a short but profound and powerful story parable, a story. It comes from Luke chapter seven. If you have your Bibles, I'd love to have you turn with me or you can look up on the screen as I read this out, this really short but powerful parable Jesus tells. And in verse 40, it says this. So Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to say to you. Simon replied, say it, teacher. A certain creditor had two debtors. One owed him 500 silver coins and the other 50. When they could not pay, he canceled the debts of both. Now, which one of them will love him more? Now, this is a seemingly simple parable so far, and I'm sure Simon felt like the answer was too easy, so he, he, he says it this way, verse 33, 43. Simon answered, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt canceled. Jesus said to him, you have judged rightly. Now let me give you a little bit of context that Simon and the other Pharisees that were there, uh, Jesus' listeners would have understood that when this parable was told, he's, it's translated silver coins here, but in the original language it was denarii. That was the amount of money that was there. One debtor owed his lender 50, the other one 500. Now a denarii was a day's wages in Jesus' time. Now, if we allow for inflation, which has increased way too much lately, but if we translate it into American money today, that 50 silver coins would have been about $15,000. That's a lot of money, right? If you're saying, no, that's not a lot of money, can, can we be friends? Can we hang out? Can you take me out to dinner after? $15,000, that's a lot of money. But the other guy owed 500, and in today's dollar amount, that would have been over $150,000. That's a lot of money. Jesus tells his parable, neither one could pay him back, but the creditor granted forgiveness and canceled the debts of both of them. Then he asks this question, which one would love him more? Simon answers, rightly. It seems so too easy, because it's, it is easy to figure out. I went to college in New York State, just on the Hudson River, just across what was formerly known as the Tappan Zee Bridge. And my dorm was at one side of the campus, but most of my classes were on the complete other side of the campus. My campus was on a hill, and it was often really cold and rainy and windy. It, the wind would come off the Hudson River, and when it snowed and so on, having to walk from one part of the campus to the other, even though I was young and fit, just seemed too much for me. And truth be told, I usually woke up at the last possible minute to get to class. And so walking across campus, I didn't find easy. So I took my car. 
Now that doesn't sound that bad, except my particular campus had certain places, if you had a car on campus, that you could park, and certain places you couldn't park if you didn't have the permit. Where my classes were, I did not have a permit. And so I would regularly drive over to my classes thinking, oh, you know, I hope campus security doesn't see my car. I hope they're, you know, that they were in another place at another time. But can I tell you, they saw it every time. And often I'd come out of class and on my windshield was a ticket, a parking ticket, and that I owed some money. Now, when I was young, I wasn't particularly intelligent. Now I'm just older. And so I may or may not have had a collection of tickets in my glove compartment that I had accumulated over the time, thinking that somehow they would magically get paid. Until I got a letter in my campus mailbox that said, Dear Mr. Butterfield, you owe over $400 worth of parking tickets. If you don't pay them today, you need to get your car off campus and you can never park on campus again. Wow, that's freaked me out because I knew I couldn't pay for a tow and they would hold my car potentially if they towed it until I could pay it. So I owed over $400 in tickets and I was about $395 short. <laughs> so I did what, the only thing I could do is I went into the campus security office and the head of campus security, his name was Rich, and most people did not like Rich. Not because he did anything bad, but he used to catch us doing everything bad. And so he had a reputation, no one really liked, uh, you know, Campus 5.0, and so um, I'm in the office, and I said, Rich, I have to be honest with you. I can't pay this. I know I've accumulated these tickets. I, I, I know that, that, you know, I need to get my car off campus. I'm just asking for a couple of hours to find a place where I can park it, and I'll, I'll do my best to pay off the $400 plus at the end of the semester if I can. Now, I, there was no way I'm calling up my dad and saying, hey, dad, uh, I have $400 that I uh, got in parking tickets. Can you cover that for me? Because I know there would be a very quick click. And so I, I said that to, to Rich. He looks at me and he says, Kevin, appreciate you coming in. Don't worry about it. I'm thinking, what? Don't worry about it. Like, you mean, don't worry about getting my car off campus today? Like, what, do, what? And he said, no, don't worry about the tickets. And he, in front of me, just ripped up the bill and threw it away. Can I tell you something? I love that guy. <laughs> Whenever anyone would talk bad about campus security and Rich, I was the first to come to his defense and to their defense. My Whole perspective changed in a moment when my debt was canceled and it was ripped up in front of me. That's the parable of the two debtors that Jesus tells, and Simon answers correctly. But the most powerful part of this parable is why Jesus is telling this story and in the context that he's telling the story. Because this wasn't just Jesus on a hillside speaking to the crowds. This was a dinner party. It was a dinner party that Simon, who was a Pharisee, a religious leader of the day, was throwing for him and all of his friends, and he invited Jesus to come to it. Now, most of the Pharisees didn't like Jesus. They checked him out. They were looking at him, and the way he taught, what he said, how he said it, and to whom he was saying things to really ruffled their feathers. But Simon was at least willing to have Jesus come into his house for a meal to check him out somewhat up close. That's the context of the story. But in this particular dinner party, everything changes because someone crashed the party. And in this party that Jesus had thrown for him by Simon and the religious leaders of the day, in comes a woman. And not just any woman. The text says that this woman had been known to be a sinner. Some translations said that she had lived a sinful life. Simon and all of, her, all of his friends would have known who she was and what her reputation was. And this woman comes in, and she doesn't just sit in the background quietly. She comes right to the feet of Jesus, and it says that she, she was behind Jesus, and that she began weeping 
at his feet. Now the word we have for weeping isn't just tears coming down like because of a, a, a touching Hallmark commercial. She's weeping, full on crying, full heart and soul being poured out, tears rushing down her face. This is a full ugly cry. And her tears are all over Jesus' feet. And as she sees her tears at Jesus' feet, she pulls down her hair, which again in Jesus' time and culture would have been seen as an inappropriate thing for a woman to show her hair, especially in a group of men. But she doesn't care. She takes down her hair and she begins wiping the tears and the dirt off of his feet as she's still weeping. Then even more than that, she begins kissing his feet over and over again. And the text says that she brought an alabaster, a very expensive and costly jar of perfume and ointment. She breaks open the jar and she begins to anoint Jesus' feet. And the smell fills the air. And the sounds and the sights and how the smells fill the room, that's there. The text says that Simon sees this woman. He knows who she is. He knows what she's done and that she is not a welcome guest and never would be at one of his parties. And he says in his heart, if this guy were really a prophet, if he was anywhere near to being the Messiah as some claim him to be, he would know who she is, what she's done, what she's like, who she hangs out with, her reputation, and he would do what any good religious leader do and throw her out of his home. Jesus knows what's going on in Simon's heart. That's when Jesus tells this parable about the two debtors. And he says to Simon, who would love more? He says, I'm supposed the one who owed a greater debt. That's the scene in which Jesus tells this parable. Why would she do this? Why would she pour out her heart, her soul, and even her costly money? Why would she not care what anyone thought as she lavishly pours out her tears, pulls down her hair, anoints Jesus' feet, kisses his feet repeatedly? Why would she do that? And the answer is in the parable. It's this. Gratitude is the natural expression of forgiveness. Gratitude is the natural expression of of forgiveness. Jesus receives this attention and affection in the display because he knows the gratitude that comes from her receiving mercy, grace, and forgiveness. But he's not done yet. And he wants to expose the heart of Simon. But he really wants to expose the heart of God into the situation. And then in verse 44, Jesus continues. He says, then turning towards the woman, as Jesus is gazing at the woman, he begins to speak to Simon. And he said to Simon, do you see this woman? Do I see her? I can't not see her. I hear her, I smell it. I, I can't get her out of my gaze, let alone out of my house. And Jesus says, I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss of greeting, but from the time I entered, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil. She has anointed my feet with perfumed oil. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. Thus, she loved much. But the one who has forgiven little loves little. Read that again. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, canceled, paid. Thus, she loves much. The one who's forgiven little loves little. Gratitude is the natural expression 
of receiving forgiveness. The difference between Simon and this woman was not the amount of their sins, but the amount of forgiveness received and the love and the gratitude expressed. This woman knew her past, her story, what's going on in her life. She knew the amount of sin that she had. She knew the amount of mercy and love and grace she needed and was extended to her at the feet of Jesus. Simon was self-righteous. That is, that Simon believed that his works, his acts, his choices, his right living, his observance of all the Old Testament laws and all the rituals were going on, that somehow that his attention to doing that stuff not only didn't have any sin, but actually that earned him forgiveness. That earned him God's affection. And therefore, his self-works in his mind produced self-righteousness. Simon believed, like his friends and like many, to say that, hey, what I've done, that makes me righteous. And this woman, she knew that she could never be made righteous. And so she wasn't self-righteous like Simon. She needed to be made righteous. And the only one who could make her righteous is the one who paid her debt. You know, see, Jesus didn't just rip up the note. He actually paid the price. Jesus was the one who said, I'll pay your bill of your life, of God's judgment the penalty of sin. I'll take it upon myself. She was made righteous because the only one who could cancel her debt said, you're forgiven. She expressed her gratitude and appreciation of the kindness and the mercy of God's love. When we realize the extravagance of his grace, of his forgiveness towards my wretchedness, towards my offense, towards my sin before God, I can only respond with the extravagance of gratitude and worship. There's a paradigm shift that needs to happen because the paradigm shift is, I'm that woman, so are you, and so are we. Because the scripture said there's none righteous, No, not one. We've all blown it. We've all offended God. And whether you think you've only got $15,000 or $150,000 worth of sin, let me tell you, it's far greater than that. And the cost of my sin and your sin was far greater than that. It cost the Son of God everything. I'm gonna ask the band to come back up. I'm gonna... Close by saying this. This is a dinner party thrown for Jesus. Some of us are just checking him out from a distance. Some of us are cool with him. But if we were to be honest, we're like Simon and said, I'm really not that bad. And there's far more worse people in our world, in our culture, in our workplace, and in our neighborhoods. Compared to them, I'm a saint. This dinner party that we're having for Jesus, who are you? Are you Simon? Or are you this woman? Who we really are, can I say, is revealed in our expression of gratitude thanksgiving and our expression of have we received his mercy and grace or do we think we've earned it there may be someone here today who you say no I'm like this woman if you knew my story Kevin you wouldn't want me here in church well I can tell you you're in a room full of people that if everything we thought or did or felt or said was projected onto that screen we'd all run in shame 
what we have in common is that we are all in need of his grace, his kindness, and his mercy. You are in a room full of sinners. When we come together, we come, like I said last week, as beloved sons and daughters, but our adoption costs him everything. We are unworthy servants and beloved sons and daughters. The question is tonight, will you express the gratitude in your heart? Gratitude is not made complete until it's expressed. We know this. Now, I don't want you to do anything just out of duty. I don't want you to do anything just because of what others would think or may not think or what response you expect me or others to have. But as we enter this last phase of worship, who are you? Are you one that's been saved by grace, his love and mercy? Not only do we want to express that in a song or in worship together on Sundays, but may Black Rock be a place that our whole life is lived at his feet as an expression of thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. For without you, I have no hope. Would you stand with me? I want to pray, and then we'll enter a time of worship. Jesus, I'm so glad that we have all of eternity to give you the thanksgiving you deserve. But I ask that even now, we would be people that our eyes are open to the grace we need, to the amount of sin that we have committed, but even more to the amount of grace you have poured out on us. Father, thank you. May gratitude flow out of this place and out of our hearts everywhere we go as a natural expression of the forgiveness we've received in Christ Jesus. Amen.
church. Thank you for being here this morning and watching online. And I know that uh, for you, that uh, God moved in speaking to you about this idea of forgiveness and that we can never, ever repay uh, Jesus for what he has done, but we need to accept that gift. Just as uh, Kevin was able to accept the gift of uh, those traffic tickets being uh, forgiven, that Jesus has forgiven all of our sin, and there's nothing I can do to uh, express my thanks to him, but my whole life is a expression of that thanks uh, to him for what he has done in my life. And so I hope today that you can reflect more on that passage and on what uh, Pastor Kevin spoke to you about, and and for you to say, how do I internalize this? How do I... Uh, Think about this more throughout today and so that my life this week might be different because of what uh, Jesus uh, said to you today. And so that is always our prayer, that uh, each and every Sunday, that our souls are encouraged, but not just encouraged for that day, uh, but that we are different people because of what God has spoken to us. And so that is our prayer, that you will be a different person uh, today and for the rest of your life from what uh, the Lord spoke to you today about. Hey, I just want to encourage you with, with a few things. Uh, again, uh, we have our Women's Weekend coming up, and so please go to blackrock.org uh, and check out the information on our Women's Weekend. You don't want to miss it, especially if you are not connected here at the church. Uh, it is a great weekend to get connected to other women uh, within our church, and so don't make don't make it where your excuse is, I don't know anyone. Uh, I think that's the perfect reason for you to go is to experience 
encourage uh, that community uh, with, with the women uh, in early May. So definitely check that out. Uh, we also have a class coming up called uh, What is the Gospel? And it's a five-week class. It starts next Sunday at uh, 10 o'clock. And so uh, if you're in the area and uh, are looking to explore more of what is the gospel, what does that mean to me, um, we'd love for you to join that class. Again, you can uh, find information on our website about uh, what is the gospel class. Again, that starts next Sunday uh, during our 10 o'clock service. Thank you for joining us today. And uh, I just want to say uh, you are blessed because you today realize that uh, your sins are forgiven uh, and that uh, because of that, you now have a way to worship uh, the Lord and Savior uh, because of that forgiveness that you uh, received through Jesus. And so live in freedom, live in that forgiveness, uh, and extend that forgiveness to a lost world around you. Have a blessed week. See you next Sunday.